this song is for imperfect people. People like myself who haven't always done everything right. Come on, big up. People who have made mistakes in their lives. I'd just like to make one thing clear today. That regardless of what you're going through, and regardless of what you've done, you are still important to God. Hello. You are important. You are still important. Important to God. Yes. Yes, you are. Yes, you are important. You are still important. You are important to God. Yes, you are. Yes, you are important. You are still important. Important to God. Yes, you are. Yes, you are important to God. I hear you, but you don't know what I've done. No matter what you have done, His love He'll never take it away. I know it's hard to believe that He's the one you but Yes, you are. Yes, you are important. I know you are still important. About it doesn't they know matter my what people say They can't stop you from getting to him anyway All that matters is you're important to God Yes, you're important to God All that matters is you're important
right No matter what it feels like A great God deserves a great praise. It is again that we are grateful to God that God has kept us another week. And we don't take it for granted all of what's going on in our society today. When God has kept us, we got sense enough to be grateful. I certainly want to thank all of our friends and family that you are taking the time to listen in to what God has to say to the people of God. We are certainly concerned about the, um, this new vaccine, and I believe, I'm trusting that God will uh, make sure that the vaccine is safe for all of us. Because in order for us to get back into our church home, all of us have to be vaccinated. And from what I understand so far, it is doing a good job. And so we don't want to be in fear all of the time. We want to... Hurry up if we can and get back into our station whereby we can worship and praise and magnify God, all of us together once again. I miss those times. Well, today, I want to return to the book of Jonah, the fourth chapter, if you will. We're talking about forgiveness for myself and justice for everyone else. Forgiveness for myself and justice for everyone else. And in the first four verses of the fourth chapter of the book of Jonah in the New Living Translation, we read as follows. This change of plans greatly upset Jonah. He became very angry, so he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive is what I predicted will not happen. The Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? Amen. The Lord replied, is it right? For you to be angry about this. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of his word. Let us pray. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, shelter from a stormy blast, and yes, our eternal home. Lord, we pray that you use us, that we might preach unto your people the gospel of everlasting life, that folks might see more of thee and less of me, in Jesus' precious name, and the people of God said, Amen, Amen, and Amen. Forgiveness for myself and justice for everyone else. Now, I need to tell you that this sermon is going to have an edge of steel in it. For I hardly feel like I ought to, I can hardly say this, but our God requires of us to be transparent. And he requires that we be honest. This guy Jonah was angry at God. And if we are honest, angry with God on the surface sounds like blasphemy. But have you ever been angry with God? Come on now, do not try to hide behind being religious and forget your humanity. On the surface, it looks like the stuff that destroys the soul in the presence of a sovereign God. Nevertheless, our text informs us that Jonah had the nerve to be angry with God. It displeased him. It displeased him that the Lord had gave the Ninevites a pardon. It displeased him that the Ninevites had found through God's grace a relationship with him equal to that of the Jews. It displeased Jonah that he could no longer lay 
exclusive claim to the grace of God. But others, even his enemies, were able to receive this grace as well. It displeased Jonah greatly that the people responded overwhelmingly to God's word, putting on sackcloth and ashes. Why? He would have been much happy had they locked him up for disturbing the peace. He would have been much happier had they approached him as an alien and continued the same racial animosity that had characterized their lives. Instead, they all received the word of God, repented of their sins, and rejoiced in the God of their salvation. And this Jonah preacher, mm, Brother Rabbi Jonah, became, became angry. And what is more apparent, he became angry at God. Well, that was Jonah's attitude. He loved the Lord, but he, he wanted out. He rebelled upon seeing the grace of God shared with those he thought beyond the mercies of God. He wanted salvation, but only for the name of those of the Jews. He wanted the word of God, but only for the Hebrews. He wanted his sons and daughters to know the epic miracles of God's deliverance as they occurred in Abraham's life, as it occurred with Moses at the Red Sea or Joshua at the walls of Jericho, but he only wanted it for the Jews. Jonah was a modern-day counterpart of many who want salvation, but only for themselves, only for their church, only for their denomination, only for their specific organization, only for their racial group, only for their ethnicity. However, they fail to remember that our God created us all and God loves us all, that God's grace will prevail in spite of our human shortcomings, that God's providence will prevail in spite of our twisted interpretations. And I thank God my God, that salvation isn't totally dependent upon human beings, for if it was, we would all be lost. Why? Because nobody is perfect and nobody is righteous. Why? We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We are sinners saved by grace. Why? The tablets of the Ten Commandments was broken by Moses. The moral law was mutilated by David. Why? Faithfulness was laughed at by Sarah. A ministry was abandoned by Demas, and still, through it all, we have a church and a Savior, and through it all, we have the Word of God, and through it all, we have a congregation of baptized believers, and through it all, we have a gospel that uh, in, empowers us and encourages us in spite of ourselves, and through it all, we have a rich history and hope beyond the grave, and the miracle is that God has taken our earthly, mortal, finite frames and done something good in spite of ourselves. The miracle is that God has taken an angry Jonah and saved the whole nation in spite of the preacher's attitude. And picking up from last time we spoke, the fourth chapter of Jonah, we find two mistakes that Jonah makes that you and I have to seek to avoid. And they both include resentment. The first one we addressed last time, resenting God's plan when it doesn't fit my plan. And today, the second resentment, resenting God's mercy and goodness to other people. You see, when God is good to people I don't want him to be good to, I get upset. When God is merciful and forgiving to people I don't want him to forgive, then I get upset. And that's what happened to Jonah. Jonah hates that God is forgiving people that he doesn't like. In Jonah 4, 2, it says this, Then Jonah complained, and he's talking to God. Listen, if you please. Didn't I say before I left home that I knew you would do this, Lord? I knew you would forgive these people, and that's, that's why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you are gracious and compassionate. I knew that you are slow to get angry. I knew that you are filled with unfailing love. I knew how easily you could cancel your plans and not punish these people now. Now notice, if you please, the four things that Jonah knows about God. Hallelujah. He says, I know you're gracious and compassionate. I know you are patient. I know you are slow to get angry. I know your love is unlimited, is everlasting, it's eternal. And then he goes, I know that you would forgive these people 
rather than punish them. And it amazes me. He knew all those good things about God. And in spite of all of that, he gets depressed. But why? Well, here's why. Because Jonah had a problem that a lot of people have today. My mind. He was selfish and he was jealous. We want forgiveness for ourselves, but we want justice for everybody else. We want to be forgiven. We want God to show us grace and mercy. We want God to show us uh, how we can make it the next day. But this guy, this girl who hurt me, Lord, I want you to get them. Did you hear that? I deserve grace, but they deserve justice. I, I deserve compassion, and I, I deserve mercy, but Jonah wants God to forgive him, but he doesn't want him to forgive anybody who has hurt him. And if that be the case, then all of us would not be forgiven because all of us have hurt somebody sometime in our lives. Am I right about it? Well, he's resentful. He's resenting that God is actually showing mercy to somebody who has hurt him. He's resentful that God is showing mercy and forgiveness to somebody he doesn't like, even his enemies. He, he wants forgiveness for himself, but he wants justice for everybody else. So let's, let's get real today. Let's not only talk about this guy thousands of years ago, let's talk about you. Why do you want God not to forgive others? Why do you want God not to forgive now, please, God, I hear you say, don't forgive them. They, they hurt me too much. But who has hurt you so much that you don't want God to show them mercy? Because this, my friends, is the Jonah trap. It happens as much today as it happened to this guy a long time ago. Who are you willing to forgive? Who are you not willing to forgive that God has already forgiven? Why? God has already forgiven them, but you have it because you think you know better than God. However, you're only hurting yourself. You're not hurting them. Holding on to resentment and holding on to that hatred and holding on to that hurt is not hurting them. And it's all it's doing is making your life miserable. Who are you willing or who are you unwilling to forgive that God has forgiven? Now, the story is told about a guy named John Wesley, a English theologian and evangelist who was the leader of a revival movement within the Church of England known as Methodism. And the report was one day a guy came up to John Wesley and this guy told him, I could never forgive this other guy. Upon which John Wesley told him, well, I hope you never sin. Why? Because you don't want to burn the bridge that you have to walk across to get to heaven. You see, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 15, if you forgive others the wrong they've done to you, your Father in heaven will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, your Father will not forgive the wrongs you have done. Uh-oh. When you refuse to forgive, you, you are burning the bridge. You have to walk across to get to heaven. And if you're unwilling to forgive others, God said, why should I forgive you? If you're unwilling to show grace to others, why should I show grace to you? You want everybody else to have justice, but you want mercy. Well, that's the Jonah trap. And that is the Jonah mistake that you and I need to learn to forgive everybody who's ever hurt us for three reasons. You need to say that again. You need to forgive everybody who's hurt you for three reasons. One, past, two, present, and three, future. Now listen carefully. Three reasons you need to let it go no matter how bad they treated you. But do, do they deserve it? Of course not. But you don't deserve it either. Forgiveness is never deserved. Forgiveness is never earned. Forgiveness is just a gift. You don't forgive them because they deserve it. You forgive them because you want to feel better. You do it for your sake. You let them off the hook for three reasons. First, I've been forgiven a lot in the past myself. 
And, and so I need to forgive other people. And second, holding on to hurt right now makes me miserable. I end up thinking about them all the time. And I don't need to have my brain invaded by them all the time. And three, I'm going to need more forgiveness in the future because it's impossible for us to be perfect all the time. Remember, we're sinners saved by grace. We sin every day. So I need to let it go for three reasons. Past, I've already been forgiven. Present, I don't want to be miserable now. And third, I'm going to need more forgiveness in the future. Friends, you need to let it go. You've got to let it go, not because they deserve it. You didn't deserve forgiveness that God has given you. You let it go because holding on to hurt only hurts you. So now, Jonah gets mad because God does good things to people who repented. And you think that Jonah would be more gracious. But God had shown him an awful lot of grace for his stinky attitude and his willful rebellion. Now, there was another possible motive that Jonah uh, has that we see here in Jonah 4 and 3, where Jonah goes, I'd rather be dead than alive. Nothing that I told them has happened. But what is he worried about here? His reputation? He said, God, you told me to go to Nineveh and tell them in 40 days the city will be destroyed if you don't turn, if you don't repent, if you don't come back to God. And now it hasn't happened. That makes me look bad, God. He's more worried about how he looks to people than people's salvation. He'd rather see an entire city destroyed then him look bad. He goes, you know it's better for me not to even be alive. This makes me look bad. I'm worried about how I appear to others. Are you? Are you worried about how you appear to others? I'm worried about how I appear to others. And now, because of this, in the second half of chapter 4, God has to teach Jonah an object lesson. And here's one that we have to learn. You see, we all know that life is always filled with interruptions. Am I right about it? We all know that life is always filled with dead ends. However, there are some things all of us need to remember when things don't go our way. I said that all of us need to remember the things that happen to us when things don't go our way. When our plans don't match God's plans, there are four things we need to remember. And the first one we're going to talk about today and the other three next time. First, I need to remember God can see things I cannot see. Did you hear what I said? God can see things I cannot. I have to remind myself when things don't go my way that God can see things that I cannot see. Jonah is upset that God has said, I'm going to destroy if they don't turn to me. However, if they turn to me, I'm going to let them have another chance. And Jonah is upset about it. And then in verse 4, it says, Then God asked Jonah, who's all ticked off, <laughs> What right do you have to be angry over what I have done? Hallelujah. Why should you be angry? that I've forgiven these people. He's going, are you God? Are you wiser than me? Can you see things I can't see? Well, anytime you doubt God's wisdom, you're going to get in trouble because God is God and you're not. And when I have my plans and all of a sudden God has plans that's different than my plans and I start to get upset about it, I need to remember that God can see things that I can't see. God can see the past, the present, and the future all at the same time because he's not limited by time. Hallelujah. We're on this planet that circles 24 hours around the sun and rotates. And if you weren't on this planet, your concept of time would be very different. But God is timeless. He can see past, present, and future all together. He can see what you can't see. So you need to trust, and I need to trust, 
God's wisdom. When we doubt God's wisdom, we get in trouble. Did you hear what I said? When we doubt God's wisdom, we get in trouble. Why? God has to deal with a lot of people in the Bible like this. Not only this guy named Jonah, but there was a guy named Job. God said to Job in Job 38, God said to Job in Job 38 and 2, who are you The question my wisdom? Where were you, Job, when I made the world? Where were you when I erected the highway of the sky and pushed floating worlds out upon the broad sea of time and flashed forth the light and put an end to the age of darkness? Where were you, Job? And who are you, Job, to question me? And Job had to finally say, oh, Lord and my God. God says, I don't need uh, you to advise me when to change plans. I don't need to consult you uh, because I know what's better for you than you know what's better for you. When things don't go the way you plan and when things don't go the way I plan, I need to remember that God is good all the time, that God is God, and I'm not. I just need to trust God. I need to trust in his wisdom. I need to trust God when I can't see things that he can see. Well, Ecclesiastes 3.11 says this, God does everything right and on time. <laughs> the choir used to sing a song that says he's an on-time God. Yes, he is. He may not come when you want him, but he's always right on time. God is never late. You may think he's late, but God is never late. But people can never completely understand what God does because he sees the whole scope. His work is from beginning to the end. We don't see what God sees. I don't have the brain capacity to see from the beginning to the end. And you don't either. So God is saying to all of us, don't doubt me. Don't doubt me when you're going through your tough times. I know what's going on. I can see where it's headed. I know the beginning from the ending. And yes, I know the end of the story. And I read the last chapter. And I got you. Did you hear that? God says, I got you. Hallelujah. Yes, I hold, said God, the title deed to everything that happens in life. And if you follow me, Everything will be all right. Whatever you're going through, please remember that all things work together for good for them that love God and the call according to his purpose, that God is still merciful, that God still saves to the utmost, that God still blesses his people. While the songwriter says it best, we are our heavenly father's children and we know he loves us one and all. Yet there are times where we find the answer, another voice that calls. But if we are willing, he will keep us. His voice is only to obey no matter where, for he knows. I say, yes, he knows just how much we can bear. So I close by telling you that God knows and God cares that everything is going to work out according to God's word, way, and will in your life. And if God cares about me, I, it's good enough for me. Somebody said, if God cares about me, it's good enough for me. I'll find mercy and salvation for my soul if I trust him and never doubt him. I, I need to tell you, church, that you ought to sing this song when you're going through a storm in your life. I need thee Oh. I need thee every hour. I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come, I come to thee. And we bless God that he sent his only begotten son to save us. And save us he did. Hallelujah. Yes, from raw regal robes. He's wrapped in swaddling cloths that lay in a manger. No room in the inn at 12 years old. Ha <laughs> ha. He confounded the wise men at 30 years old. He began his public ministry. The blind see, the lame walk, the dumb speak, the poor had the gospel preached to them. At 33 years old, Jesus makes the ultimate sacrifice. And there, in the city of the skull, Calvary by name. They crucified him there. He never said a mumbling word. He told God, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And when it was all over, he said, it is 
finished into thy hands. I commend my spirit. He died until death died. He died until hell would leave us alone. But oh, three days later in the golden splendor of a Sunday morning sunrise, up from the grave he arose with all power in his almighty hands. Hallelujah, yes. And he told all of us, I am he that was dead. Behold, I'm alive forevermore. I've got the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And if you believe in God, you don't have to worry about no death. No dying, no undertaker, no cemetery, none of that. For I hear Jesus say, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believeth thou this. Amen. The doors of the church is open and Jesus is calling. If after having heard the ministry of this church, we're praying that God will send salvation to your heart and that you'll come to Jesus while you have the time. He tells us, come now. While the blood yet run warm in your veins, come now. Jesus is saying, behold, I stand at the door of your heart and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I come in and sup with him and he with me. The doors are open. I'm praying that you call our deaconess, Kareen Griffin, 718-453-1278. Tell Sister Griffin, tell Sister Griffin, put your name on the church roll and tell God to put your name on the Lamb's Book of Life. My God, when it's over, we shall wear a crown. My God, we're going stately stepping to a great coronation where there'll be no more crying and no more dying. And every day will be Sunday. The Sabbath will have no end. It's going to happen one day. Don't not be concerned about your salvation. Jesus came sacrificed his life that you might be saved, that you, whatever you're going through, that you might have eternal life. Hallelujah, yes. The doors are open. Come by letter, candidate for baptism on Christian experience. Amen. We're asking all of our family members and friends to consider your church, that this church needs your financial support. We don't want to be pushy, and we don't want to be overbearing, but your church needs your support. And many members will listen and don't do what they know they ought to do. Give, give to your church, that we might have the resources that we need that we might be able to pay our expenses. Expenses still go on, and we're praying that we'll soon be able to get back into our church home, but we need you. We gotta, we gotta do a lot of things in order to prepare our building that we might be safe when we get back to our church home. We ask that we would be mindful of that. We have four methods prescribed that we might be able to support our church. We're asking every one of us who will to do your level best. Don't say to yourself, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it next week. No, no. Get on the phone. Do it now. Get on your internet. Get on your whatever the medium it is. We've got four ways. Do it now. We're asking that you would be living your giving and we're praying that God will keep each and every one of you. And now, may the grace of our Father, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest rule of the Bible, be thy your people, both now and forevermore. The people of God said, Amen, Amen, and Amen.